like to thank you all for coming to this event. We're really pleased to welcome you to this report launch today, and we've got a fantastic panel of speakers. Um, Positive Money are really excited to launch this report, The Future of Cash, Protecting Access to Payments in Digital Age. We were hoping that Elizabeth Anderson, who's the business editor of the I newspaper, um, was going to chair the event this evening, but unfortunately, due to personal circumstances, she's had to cancel, so you're left with me. Um, I'm the executive director of Positive Money, and we are a research and campaigning non-profit. Uh, our mission is to reform the money and banking system so that it supports serving a fairer, more democratic, and more sustainable economy. We'd really like to thank um, Barrow Cadbury Trust for supporting the research, this work that we've been doing over the, just over, for just over a year. Uh, and one of the reasons it's a particularly exciting uh, report for us to be launching is because those of you that are very familiar with Positive Money's work know that generally we're working on quite long, slow, difficult work of trying to change macroeconomic thinking. Uh, and this report feels much more relevant and um, especially to the current discussions and the current discussions that seem to be accelerating on the future of cash, um, those in government, um, but also around the regulatory system as well. And it doesn't feel at all like we're kind of stuck in ivory tower thinking with this report. So that's really exciting for us. And we've seen how relevant it is. Just a week ago on the 13th, the Treasury announced that it's going to be doing an open consultation on cash and digital payments. Um, between now and June, uh, between yeah, digital payments and the new economy, and we'll be feeding in our findings from the report to their consultation. And additionally, the Treasury Select Committee already has a inquiry underway on digital currencies. Um, so government and Parliament uh, are clearly picking up that things are moving fast in this space, and that changes do require regulatory oversight. So uh, we've got. David Clark, who's the Head of Policy and Advocacy at Positive Money, who wrote the report, um, who's going to lead the, the evening and give us an overview of the report and its findings. And then we have um, responses from, from three fantastic speakers. Catherine West is an MP for Hornsey and Wood Green. Um, before being elected, she was the leader of Islington Council. Uh, in February 2013, she was awarded uh, Local Authority Leader of the Year by the Local Government Information Unit on her work leading the Islington Fairness Commission. And she was Shadow Foreign Minister between 2015 and 2017 and now sits on the International Trade Committee. Carl Packman is a Research and Good Practice Manager at Toynbee Hall. Before this, he was an independent researcher working with a number of organisations, including think tanks and academic institutions, working on projects looking at financial inclusion and household over-indebtedness. And he's written two books on personal debt and the payday loans industry and was the author of a report with the TUC in 2014 on the impact of benefit delay, looking at the impact of universal credit on claimant debt profiles. And finally, Drew Hendry, MP, uh, is the MP for Inverness, the SNP, and he's their spokesperson for business, energy and industrial strategy. Um, before gaining a seat in Westminster, Drew was leader of Highland Council and in 1999 he founded Tech Plan Limited, a company which delivers digital marketing services for online retailers and e-commerce merchants. She also sits on the Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy Select Committee and is the chair of the all-party parliamentary group on digital economy. So uh, if you just want to join me in welcoming our speakers and then we'll kick off for David to introduce the report. Thanks, Fran. The ability to make payments is fundamental to any individual's participation in the economy. Being able to manage your money and pay for the things you need is as important to everyday life as access to water or electricity. At the moment, 2.7 million people rely almost exclusively on cash, and millions more use cash on a regular basis. Technology and payments is developing rapidly, and there's a long-term <coughs> decline in cash use, but all the evidence suggests that people will continue to use cash for a long time into the future. So we've set out to consider who has a preference for cash, what are the reasons um, for people wanting to use cash, and how can we ensure that those people's interests are protected. 
So I want to start by telling you three things uh, you might already know about the people that the kinds of people that rely on cash, and three things which might surprise you. People on lower incomes are more likely to rely on cash. Of, of the 2.7 million people who relied on cash during 2016, over half had household incomes of less than £15,000 a year. Older people are more likely to rely on cash. Nearly 40% of all of the people relying on cash are 65 or over. And people relying on cash are, more, are less likely to live in urban areas. Three, but three surprising facts. Uh, there are hundreds of thousands of 18 to 24 years, uh, year olds rely, reliant on cash. <coughs> Most of the people who rely on cash have access to a bank account. So often we talk about cash reliant people and unbanked people as being synonymous, but actually, um, you know, they're two kind of distinct groups. And lots of people who like to use cash on a regular basis are actually have a high degree of digital capability. Um, so it's not, you know, it's a lot of people who have access to electronic payments are still preferring to use their money in cash. What are the reasons why people would like prefer to use cash? So a lot of people find it useful for budgeting. You know how much money you have and what you're spending it on. A lot of people are distrustful of banks. Um, a majority of, of adults in the UK don't trust banks to work in their customers' best interests, and so that's the reason why a lot of people um, use, like to use cash instead. And a lot of people don't like the frictionless nature of electronic payments. So the, the fact that paying for stuff like with your card or online requires fewer conscious steps um, than using physical cash. Um, and the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute has done some really good research looking at why um, a lot of people with mental health conditions self-exclude from using electronic payments because of the risk of having access to electronic payments during a period of mental health crisis. Cash reliance is often talked about in terms of a problem that we have to <coughs> rescue people from. Um, but actually, people have a range of really legitimate and rational reasons for wanting to use cash. There are powerful forces driving the decline of cash and powerful vested interests who'd like to see the back of it. Visa, Mastercard, um, big banks. But its, its decline is not inevitable and if we leave people to their own devices, there will still be a demand for cash for millions of people for a long time into the future. So cash will only disappear if no one steps in to protect it. And I want to talk about um, one way that we should protect people's ability to use cash, and that's access to cash machines. So the, the vast majority of people um, access cash via cash machines, um, particularly with the worrying trend of bank branch closures. Um, so we've looked primarily at cash machines as, as an issue that needs uh, attention at the moment. So if you go and carry out a transaction at a cash machine, your bank pays a fee, and that's how the cost of running the cash machine is paid for. At the moment, we have a reasonably even spread of cash machines because the fees that banks pay are roughly equivalent to the cost of operating the machine. Most cash machines are connected by the Link Network, um, which is made up is a membership organisation made up of the big banks and the companies that operate the machines. Uh, but that network, the fundamental thing is that that is funded by fees from uh, the banks. And at the moment, there's a lot of pressure from banks to, for, for Link to reduce its fees. Um, and it's recently, at the start of this year, um, has confirmed the first in an incremental series of reductions of the fees that banks have to pay for ATMs. Obviously, if banks are paying less for people to, use tra to make transactions at an ATM, that puts ATMs at risk. Um, and you, there have been warnings that we're about to see a kind of, uh, significant reduction in the number of ATMs available. Why is this happening now? Um, you may not know that Visa and Mastercard also operate their own ATM schemes. They've started offering uh, 
fees below the actual cost of running the ATM. So that's an, an attractive option for the banks. Not so good for the companies uh, running the ATM. And if banks were to move to these alternative schemes, it would mean a lot of ATMs would be likely to close. Um, we should be extremely suspicious about the motives of these card companies uh, getting involved in cash provision. It would be seriously concerning if Visa, for example, to, were to operate this essential part of our cash infrastructure. And really, the only thing that stands between us and cash access disappearing, or a lot of cash machines disappearing, is whether we have a regulator that is effective enough to step in and stop it. You, you know, Link is a well-meaning organisation, but you can't expect the Link board to be independent when the scheme is funded almost entirely by banks and, there's, uh, and it's being undermined by car companies. <clears throat> so we need a regulator that's powerful enough and determined enough to protect our access to cash, and that's why uh, in this report we've recommended that protecting cash access should be a, made a statutory duty of the payment systems regulator. So, as well as protecting cash, government and the Bank of England need to be considering how we adapt to changes in technology and payments preferences. If you think about why people choose to use cash at the moment, it's a risk-free form of payment. Um, you don't have to rely on a bank uh, to use it, and it's universally accessible and generally is accepted by retailers. Government and the Bank of England should be thinking, can we replicate these qualities of cash in a digital form? And we believe that that can be done through the issuance of a central bank digital currency or a digital version of cash. There's a lot of excitement, obviously, at the moment around uh, digital currencies with the rise of um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, but Actually, the technology for this exists already. The Bank of England already issues risk-free electronic money. It's just at the moment, the only people who have access to that are the big banks. Um, the, the introduction of a central bank digital currency or digital cash could, in principle, mean universal access to risk-free savings and payments. And for the millions of people who feel poorly served by the existing banking sector, that represents an exciting opportunity. In practice, it, its success depends on whether digital cash accounts would have different characteristics and support different facilities than those currently offered by existing bank accounts. Um, so we propose that digital cash accounts would be opened up via an indirect access approach. So it wouldn't be like the Bank of England operating um, all the, the, the accounts themselves. The, the Bank of England would hold and create the currency, but the payments and customer services would be operated separately. That could be done by tech startups, mobile phone companies, or even existing financial institutions. And we believe that this way, digital cash could help to reduce the barriers to entry in the payments market and encourage innovation. But we shouldn't rely entirely on the private sector to meet people's payments preferences, because if we do that, it's likely that some people will always be left out. <coughs> Fair and universal access to digital payments can only really be safeguarded through the introduction of a publicly owned provider of digital cash accounts with a specific remit to meet the needs of people who are currently excluded. So let's, like, imagine for a moment what uh, money and payments could look like in 2030. In one eventuality, maybe if we continue down the road we're going, cost cutting by banks and pressure from car companies will mean that cash is very difficult to access. We've got a much reduced ATM network, and the, the ATMs that remain, a lot of them you, you'll have to pay for. <coughs> Innovation has focused on novelty. So you might have like loads of different new payments methods. You can pay with your fingerprint or with your watch. But underneath it all, it's still the same big banks that are controlling people's money. 
and, if, and the option, if you don't like that, then there'll be some private digital currencies, um, risky, volatile, that still leave many people excluded. <coughs> On the other hand, let's imagine if civil society, policymakers, and regulators came together to design a payment system that recognises everyone's individual needs. People's different preferences are catered for. Many people still choose to use cash, which is widely available, but there's also universal access to electronic payments via a digital form of cash. What money and payments looks like in 2030 depends on the decisions that we make in the next few years. And I hope that this paper uh, can help us make the right ones. Thank you. Thanks, David. So we're going to hear responses from our panel now, uh, kicking off with Catherine. So thank you very much, and it's wonderful to be here. And a uh, big thank you to Positive Money for putting this evening together. Um, and I wanted to keep my comments very brief because I want to hear back from you. Um, I also am very proud to be uh, on this panel with someone from Toynbee Hall because um, often in my advice surgery at the Wood Green Library every second Friday, we give out the address of Toynbee Hall um, for people who are in really, really serious debt because obviously members of parliament often have very good staff, but very few of them can actually do that in-depth work where there are several different debts to several different companies or public bodies. Um, and I'm just so proud to have an association with Toynbee Hall. And a uh, big thank you to all the caseworkers there who do that fantastic work. There's a, a dwindling number of places to get really high quality advice. Lots of um, advisors and uh, former legal aid charities and so on now just don't do that really in-depth sitting down with person for a couple of hours and really helping them to make the right decisions and get their finances sorted out. Um, these days lots of CAVs etc don't really have that resource so they just signpost somewhere else um, and together with the Mary Ward um, Legal Centre we're really lucky here in central London to have something like that and I think what's really valuable about this report it does show the regional differences so particularly around the ATMs, it shows that there are 16% of the population who do not live close enough to an ATM, <coughs> 16 kilometres away. Um, uh, the exact statistic is in the report, but you know we're seeing increasingly um, people just not having access to an ATM. Um, very briefly, the parts of the report which struck me um, as particularly um, scary uh, that 53 percent of bank branches have closed since 1989 which is extraordinary when you think that that has sped up in the last couple of years um, and you know there are all sorts of reasons that the banks give for that but in the end a lot of our low-income uh, population who rely so heavily on cash banking and the traditional sort of banking um, are on a very low income because of the banks. So um, there does seem to be an irony there in terms of what's happened um, since 2008 and the fact that um, it seems to be the same people who get hit um, time and time again by different changes to policy and different ways of doing things. The other thing which struck me was that the National Housing Federation, which is the umbrella group for social housing providers, said that 40% of, of their um, tenants um, were not comfortable using the internet. Now, I don't know how you all feel about logging on or having a handheld device or an iPad or something, but you know, these days, if almost half of the people that you work with are not comfortable on the internet, just think how excluded they are. Um, and I think that uh, just shows the extent of the challenge which comes out in the report, um, particularly when universal credit, of course, is all done online. And that's why we see so many people falling out of benefit. And it's part of the reason why we're seeing the, the increase in homelessness is that people just cannot cope with these ways of gaining access to benefits. They then basically fall out of benefits, end up not paying their rent. All the automatic systems click in, they get all the letters, may not be able to read the letters, end up on the streets, end up with drug addiction and mental health problems. And that is part of the reason, in that cocktail of reasons, why we've ended up with almost a tripling of rough sleeping since 2010. 
Um, just very briefly, a couple of other points which I thought were very much well made in the report. Um, the importance of cash as a budgeting tool, and we all know that, those of us who have children, that you know, if you give a child pocket money from you know, sort of just after primary school age, that it does actually teach a young person if they spend big on one thing, then they won't have any money at the end of the week and so on. Um, and similarly for others, and this is regardless of sort of what income group you are in, because lots of people who are in high income groups also have problems with managing money, um, but that cash actually can help you. So if you know that you've got 50 pounds to get to yourself to next Saturday, you work out your travel, you work out all the things that you need, um, whereas assuming that everybody will just be able to use um, other products which are not cash, I think is a very big assumption. So um, the other thing, um, of course, is just um, underlying all this um, is not wanting to let the banks get away with <laughs> what they want to do. Um, and I think we all know that there's been a, a building of a sense of a lack of trust in institutions, be that in democracy, as an MP, I know coming in in 2015 as a new MP, that you know people were questioning whether MPs could be trusted with money given how they spent <laughs> their own budgets. Um, you know, there's been a real question mark over um, you know, the church hasn't there as an institution because of the child abuse scandals. There's been a real question mark. And for the banks and the way that they really did all that casino banking and basically smashed up the toys while they were in charge of the financial system, um, I think that that's been a real lesson sort of to us um, as consumers um, as to what banks are kind of are capable of. Um, and I work with a lot of people who work in financial services and I don't think it's the people necessarily who you see in the bank branches, but the decision makers at the top of banks who are still paying themselves a, a large amount of money, which is way over the recommended 20 times the lowest paid person in the organisation, which is what I believe is a good kind of rule of thumb. Um, they are responsible for some of the big mistakes that have happened, so the LIBOR scandal, the interbank loan scandal, um, the tax evasion scandals which have dogged some of the major banks. Um, we've had um, the money laundering scandals which is still um, working its way through the legal system and of course uh, just bank closures. Um, and I'm sure like Drew, I've fought bank closures in Wood Green in my own constituency. We ran a big campaign with HSBC and I got HSBC into my office and you know banged my fist on the table and we had community groups and everything. We did a massive petition, it made not one bit of difference. Yeah. So, you know, I'm afraid I'm very hardline on the banks and I don't think that they should be able to just get away with closing a branch and not even providing an ATM in its place. So um, I think we do need more regulation on this particular question of access to cash, and I support the recommendations in the report and look forward to asking lots of difficult parliamentary questions and stopping it to the Chancellor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and now we're here from Carl. Thank you very much. How to follow that? <laughs> How to follow that call? Um, I'm from Toynbee Hall. First of all, thank you for inviting me, uh, a representative of our organisation, to come and speak at this uh, this launch. Uh, the report is very good. If you haven't read it already, go and read it. It's an extremely uh, interesting paper with lots of facts in there, lots of counterintuitive facts as well. Uh, but also serves as a really, really good discussion point <coughs> for a lot of the conversations that I know I have, a lot of people I know have on financial inclusion, on the poverty premium, and, uh, and you know, a lot of this speaks to very, very relevant and live issues today. Bank branches, um, the Church of England has uh, brought in cashless payments. So I mean, all this sort of feeds into this, uh, you know, far and wide issues, far and wide. So we uh, we really support the report. I supported it from the moment I picked it up. Actually, in the, in the exact summary, it says cash is still relied upon by 2.7 million people, including many who are on low incomes, elderly, or struggling with ill health. Some find it useful for budgeting, while others are responding to a banking system that is failing to serve their interests. We think that's a very commonsensical view, but also it speaks to the problem of you know, those groups of people are often the people who are left behind, the, the same group of people who aren't at the forefront <coughs> of people's minds when they're devising and um, creating financial services products, for example, 
And so it's good to have a useful discussion paper that has those groups of people at the forefront. Um, so just another point on, on the use of cash and the benefits of cash. Uh, cash is a great leveler. And it's the point that's been made by Catherine already that um, it's not just these groups of people that rely on cash. Um, rich or poor, young or old, everyone really relies on cash. And I was, it was striking for me to sort of go over some of the stats out there on cash usage to find that three-fifths of cash payments that are five pounds or less in 2016 were made by cash. So, you know, that's everyone really. Everyone is implied or insinuated in if cash usage is, is, is uh, it goes out of fashion or people try and make sure that we have a cashless society, that affects everyone. So cash is the great leveler on that in that regard. Um, with regards to our demographic, people who come and visit Toynbee Hall uh, tend to be on, on low incomes, battling a uh, often losing battle against the poverty premium. And I, you know, sometimes we'll hear anecdotes about people relying on cash, but I just want to build some concrete examples of who those people are based on some of the research uh, that I've done already this year. So I spoke to a woman called Frida. Frida's 25. She's a single mother. In 2015, she was unbanked. Uh, 2015, she was internet savvy. She used to have a bank account. She used to do direct debits when she was working, but got into an accidental overdraft with them. Is now unemployed, or in 2015 became unemployed, has a credit union account that pays for everything in cash and much prefers it. In 2016, she got a bank account that still operates mainly in cash, so she'll be paid into her bank account, but take out all the cash in one go so that she can budget and control her own money in, in cash. She uses an ATM card to draw out cash in small amounts and check, balance, check her balance. Uh, only recently shopped online, but is generally distrustful of online, prefers to do everything over uh, the counter. Does not now, lo no longer does uh, direct debits and doesn't want an overdraft because of previous bad experiences. When I spoke to her again in 2017, she became unbanked again because the co-op closed her account, as they did all people who had just a current account with, her, with them. And she was not in debt, so it wasn't penalization on that front. She's fine using the credit union again as she may have <coughs> operated in cash. She only misses the ability to withdraw cash uh, at the ATM. So I think there was a point well made that a lot of people who are using cash have a bank account. She's obviously been unbanked and banked at, sim at different times in her life. But at all of those stages, she felt comfortable with cash. The idea that someone would want to take that away or, or you know, the notion of that being outside of her control with cash use drops was something that really she didn't want to um, think about because she was very comfortable with using cash and she got by just fine. Um, another example was Aaron I spoke to, 23, has a bank account but uses cash as much as he can. Um, I just want to put this in context, when I was speaking to him he didn't have notes, um, he was just telling me off the top of his head to just give you an idea of how closely he budgets for every last pound and penny that he has. So he gets £220 at ESA fortnightly and £421 monthly uh, paid into his RBS account. He uses his bank card to withdraw cash at ATMs and prefers to pay for everything in cash where possible. For example, he pays his electricity, water and council tax via card and pay point. He uses his bank card as a default if he has no cash, but prefers to pay in cash, but uses his card if he's forgotten cash. Much prefers to deal in cash as it's simpler, and his quote, I know where it's going, it's easier, and I'm set in my ways. Also, he trusts cash more. He draws the money out on payday, does shopping, pays the electricity and other bills, and leaves any leftover in the bank as savings to use for clothes, for example, a winter coat, or household stuff as, he's, as needed. It might sound like I'm going into too much detail, but I just want to give you an impression of the people that we speak to. They're not silly. Uh, they don't get themselves into um, financial distress or poverty because of a lack of caring about their own situation. Often the environment that they're in and the products that are set up and created aren't generally thinking about those people, but they don't have those people in mind, unfortunately. So they use financial control and cash use as their method of avoiding the poverty premium. Um, and lastly, I'll just finish up by saying that one of the other things in the summary recommendations that we uh, that really support and I really support was this 
I did a certain fintech firm to expand an access to electronic payments to groups which have so far been excluded. Regulators must remove unnecessary barrier, barriers to growth. That's a discussion at the, at the end of the paper, but I wanted to add to that was the accelerated programs and the programs that charities and other uh, organizations are providing to counsel certain small startups and certain fintechs and other innovators in the issues around financial health and how to avoid the poverty premium. Um, my organization, another organization called the Finance Innovation Lab, recently did the Financial Health Fellowship, which was a way of bringing in new startups, new entrepreneurs, and we did a series of um, classes and um, sort of educational programs around what issues come up for charities like my own, issues around the poverty premium, and how we can find real solutions to, uh, to avoid those things. So um, we support that recommendation as well. And so I'm glad that this discussion is uh, continuing on cash use because it's very important, not just for the people in who we see, our demographic, but also everyone. Well, and finally, I'll move over to Drew. Thank you. It's, it's always a delight to um, face the challenge of following interesting speakers and trying to remain interesting. I'll do what I can. My proposition would be that people, not technology, should determine uh, what's required for the future. Uh, it also shouldn't be the banks that determine that. They've got such a good track record, haven't they? Uh, with subprime and uh, all the other scandals, and, and it was noticeable I might just mention on that, that when the banks needed people, people were there to support the banks because they had to through the taxes. And now when we see that uh, banks are returning to profit, it's the people who are paying the price and bank closures and, uh, and, and other restrictions. Um, and I think it is important that there is a voice of people to say whether or not they want to use cash, whether or not they want to use ba uh, banks and branches and cash machines. Um, into the future. Now, I was introduced as the MP for Inverness. I'm actually the MP for Inverness near in Bainrock and Strathspey, uh, which is the longest parliamentary name in, in Parliament. <laughs> that aside, it will give you an indication that it's not just the city of Inverness I have, but a large rural area uh, within that. Within the rural areas, we have you know, pretty full employment. There's very low unemployment rates, but low incomes uh, across the, the piece in those rural areas. Um, and we also have a high demographic in terms of older people in our communities uh, there. And uh, it's uh, also an economy which uh, is one of the largest private enterprises, the, the largest private sector, is tourism. Um, now, all of those things combined mean that we rely on a lot of cash actually circulating around that local economy in order to, uh, uh, to maintain things. So people use cash in lots of different transactions. Uh, what we tend to find is that that cash circulates through those communities because people on low incomes spend their money in local shops. Uh, they don't give it all to Amazon or, uh, or to you know, faceless organizations elsewhere. They actually go down to the local shops and buy their uh, things there. Um, but we also uh, find that uh, within that uh, circulation and the, the economies of those communities, that very action, the interaction of cash within the communities helps to maintain the very fabric of the communities because people are moving around the villages and towns and actually you know, creating a healthier environment in terms of that interaction uh, with communities. Better neighbourhoods actually come out of that. So, um, so, so cash is really, really important to us in terms of what we need within our communities and it will do into the future. Um, but it also gives... Uh, choices to people, and that's very important. It's a right to have a choice uh, within that. The cash isn't for everyone, and if you consider not just those people who might, you know, might want cash because they're, they, they're working on low incomes or even because they're, uh, an older person is more comfortable with that, there's actually another group of people, quite large groups or segments of the society out there who find it very, very difficult to operate an environment outside of cash. So, for example, if you've got really bad autism, you know, you're very high in the autism spectrum, the idea of using digital banking um, is, is terrifying uh, for people. Um, and again, the, the, the move towards forcing people down that route uh, you know, disenfranchises a whole bunch of people 
um, who up until now have not been considered um, because they are collateral or un you know the part of the unintended consequence of this drive towards digital. Now you probably heard again in the introduction that I'm not getting digital. I've made made my living out of it in a, a previous uh, incarnation and before I got into politics, and it was in digital marketing, and it's. You know, it's something I understand, but I also understand that we we tried really hard to run with the paper with office for that. Everything was going to be digital, but now when you go into that office or you, know, you go into any of our MPs offices, you'll see there's great big piles of paper everywhere because the medium just doesn't suit uh, everybody all the time. So great in theory, you know, just like digital, uh, you know, digital <coughs> banking is great in theory. Of course, it's easy, it's very quick, and so forth, and everything's on there, but it doesn't work for everyone. And just like uh, other mediums, uh, you, you know, if you consider, for example, when uh, uh, when uh, radio came along, it was going to kill the newspaper, or when uh, uh, when TV came along, it was going to kill the radio, and when uh, the, you know when uh, the internet came along, it was going to kill TV. None of those things have died off, and I think it's the same um, proposition with cash and other methods of payment. All of them are fine in their environment. All of them are fine if people choose to use. Uh, those particular mediums for paying for uh, what they need, but they're not fine for everything. Just want to pick up a couple of points that uh, were made by uh, by Catherine and Carl as well. Really important thing. I remember learning about uh, getting my financial education through through cash. Um, I'm old enough to remember the uh, switch from the switch of currencies from pound, shilling, and pence into the new decimal currency. And at school, they gave us um, plastic money in order to understand the transfer from it. But I also learned, you know, if I was doing an odd job or something like that, you know, I, you know, I could earn money, I could get something in my hand, tangible reward for it, and I learned, as Carl said, I learned that, you know, the discipline of actually using cash in the budget. And that's a really important skill, I think, that we risk losing by taking that, uh, uh, that opportunity out of the field for people. I don't think it's the same to knock on the door saying, Bob a job and get a swipe your card as you go away from it. It's not the same experience, and it never will be, and it never should be. Um, so, in conclusion, I would say that, uh, that it is really important that we support the ability of people to decide for themselves the way they want to operate into the future. That we support cash where it's available. I'm absolutely on board with making it a statutory requirement. I think we absolutely must and we should. And we should never forget that it's not a one size fits all. It's not one big urban area where everybody's using their app. It's not one big situation where everybody's got the same access because that is not the case in life. And people in their communities should determine what they need for the future. Um, now we're really keen to hear um, for as many of you as possible, but before I take questions from the floor, if any of you have been to a Positive Money event before you know, we like to make them as participatory as possible. So I'm going to get you to speak to the person next to you for just five minutes, so that's two and a half minutes each, um, if, you want to, um, if you want to appoint a timer in your pair. Um, and we'd really love questions. We've heard a lot of different things around ATMs, digital technology, digital cash, cash use, Visa and MasterCard, but also it'd be great to hear about your own experiences or preferences of how you use or not use cash or payments. So five minutes and then I'm going to cut you off whether you're mid-sentence or not. <laughs> questions at a time. Um, so, okay, we're gonna, yeah, so we'll take these two, and then there's one at the back, in the green jumper. Uh, digital um, money re relies entirely on technology. Um, over the last month or so, we've been a week away from mass power cuts. Um, we're going into um, a cold war with Russia, who has a massive uh, hacking capability, uh, and, and all our technology uh, can be hacked. Um, if, if they put one power station down, that could cascade right across the country, uh, and we could be weeks without electricity. Um, what do you do if you don't have cash? Big question to kick off. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's common knowledge that um, when people use cash, 
in payments or everything. They are careful about expenditure. The banks and the car companies know very well that the only way to get people to get in debt, to get indebted, is to use a cashless uh, system. So it's, the, it's, it's in their interest to make sure that society or more and more use cash less and less. And so by so doing, people become more poorer and poorer. And so I think this is part of the reason why they are pushing for uh, cashless society more or less. Thank you. Quick question. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to try and squeeze in two questions really, really quickly. So firstly, uh, the total volume of cash goes up year on year. Uh, but the percentage in transactions goes down year on year. Like, how does that, can you explain? Um, and then the second one is, is that if you're talking about cash as a kind of homogenous thing, and there's a kind of growing campaign to get rid of like high denomination notes. So I know the UK has quite a low, compared to international comparisons, the Swiss average is a 1,000 Swiss franc note. But um, is it, does it look a bit different if you highlight one particular note, say the 50 pound note, uh, that's not uh, high usage, I imagine, amongst the kind of constituents that we've been talking about. Is there maybe a drive to uh, think about eliminating those high denomination notes? Thank you. Great questions. So, technology, electricity, Cold War Russia. Can, yeah? can I tackle the connectivity one? Yeah, do you want to kick us up? Yeah, yeah, obviously, hope to avoid any kind of war, including Cold War, but I, I understand where, where you're talk, coming from. and. Uh, uh, but, I, but I think it goes further than that. You're right to talk about power cuts. You know, as, as a, an MP who represents a, a constituency in the Highlands, um, when I moved to, uh, to my house in the Highlands in 2003, uh, very shortly afterwards, there was a, you know, a, a severe winter uh, that, that hit us, and we were without power in our community for three days. Uh, so we actually had experience of that. But it goes beyond the loss of electricity for many communities, rural communities, the level of connectivity that's required for digital transactions is just not there anyway, uh, or it's not reliable um, enough. And uh, you know, so it is a problem um, that even if you were to persuade people that uh, you didn't need cash and you could go to that digital place, uh, at the moment the infrastructure is not there. And we know that as technology moves on, it's unlikely that rural areas will catch up or be able to catch up with the urban areas as they're developed commercially uh, with it. Yeah, can we pick up the, just uh, very quickly on the, uh, the issue? I think you're spot on with your, uh, with your description of what happens in the chain uh, where people are persuaded that they should be using digital uh, all the time, and, you know, going cashless. It is a really easy leap when you look at the app that says get a loan, get an overdraft, and everything else like that. It's a really easy leap into debt. Uh, for people, and when they go into that debt, as Carl said earlier, sometimes you know, if cash is gone, where do they go? Where do the people he he mentioned earlier go after that? If there's no cash. The big open question. Can I just pick up on the point that you made about the car companies, because I think that's still a relatively new product. Um, in the uh, and, and the, the reason we know that is that wages have been flat for 30 years, and yet there's more and more people driving very expensive cars and it's because they've got these monthly payments and I think when they go to sign off on these what's like a lease I think and positive money people will know exactly what it is and the technicalities but I feel that's something which perhaps in Parliament Drew we should be looking at a bit more closely because I think people do get hoodwinked into this um, sort of transaction they can't see you don't see the cash but then suddenly you're driving a lovely car but you don't really have any money for the rent we don't have money for, you know, to put food on the table. And I think that's partly the way that the selling works. And I think we need to, um, as members of parliament, but also as sort of people who want to promote, you know, educated consumers, is looking more carefully at how some of those car deals are signed off. Because when you think about how flat our economy is, there's far too many people driving really fancy looking cars. And they are like a fleet car, you know, and that's how the, the car companies kind of manage it. Um, and I think that that is well overdue for a consumer review. Do you want to pick up on a few points? Yeah, no, if that's okay. So <clears throat> to pick up on uh, this gentleman's point down here, it's not just the banks that are, are cajoling people into uh, in bank accounts and in order to um, serve the indebted tune of, of people. 
but um, government as well. Um, so with the movement towards universal credit, um, people are being encouraged to um, get into the, get a bank account in order to accept those uh, those payments of universal credit into a, an account. Um, rather than also you know, alternative providers like the post office, the post office card account, you know, government is already signaling that they won't be paying some payments into um, a post office card account. So it's about cajoling people into getting that access. And we've already seen some of the, um, the problems that that will bring. So um, I did uh, a day in a, in a homeless centre, speaking to people in a homeless centre in Cambridge. And a lot of people there um, had very recently just fallen out outside of the benefit system altogether. They weren't, they realised where things were going. They realised that they wouldn't be able to maintain the sort of life that they had um, gotten used to, a cash only or cash reliant life. And so that means that they've just fall, fallen outside of a system that they see working against them. And that's going to happen more and more, unfortunately. And can you pick up on um, the last couple of questions around high denomination notes and, and the cash? Yeah, um, so why is there so much, why is the volume of cash in circulation going up, but the number of transactions <coughs> not? Yeah, <coughs> so um, lots of currency gets produced, used once, and then sits in someone's, uh, sits in someone's house. Um, <coughs> and which kind of positive is like often seen as a problem, but actually like it's important to remember that cash is not just a payments method; it's also a store of value. It's a risk-free like um, way of looking after your money, and for a lot of people that's attractive because they immediately don't have to rely on a bank account. Um, so I think that's yeah, like although a lot of cash might not be being used on a regular basis for payments, it's still being used as a store of value, which is important for people. Um, I, I'm kind of, I feel a bit <laughs> agnostic about like high denomination notes. I mean, they're not being, they're, again, they're, like, they're using <coughs> a, a lot as a store of value, which I guess is important for people. Um, and I think, I think if you look at some of the reasons that we've focused on in this paper about why people are relying on cash, like it's for people managing low incomes, or it's um, it's for people who uh, have ish other issues with electronic <coughs> payments. And I think whether or not like having a fifty pound note is really important for those people is a question that I've yet to kind of have a like, proper answer to. Great, thank you. So we'll take three more questions. Uh, can I just can I add to that, just very, very quickly? I spoke to someone um, not so long ago who was paid almost exclusively in £50 pound notes on the grounds that his, his employer told him that <laughs> it was easier for him to transport fewer notes but higher uh, volumes of money to pay, to distribute to all of his employees. So it could be as simple as that. Another issue, the Modi government in India demonetarised, I can't remember what the phrase was, but uh, high value notes, because uh, <coughs> high value notes were used in sort of black money transactions. Yeah. And maybe that's going on that we're not aware of, because yeah. money can't be traced, whereas the minute you have a bank account, you can be traced when you buy anything. So I let's see, in India, hang on. Time. Well, I think we're going to take three questions. So we've got time for everyone to discuss things um, afterwards. So we're going to take one, two, and then one from the back. So that's the, with the green jumper and scarf. You might need to pass it along. <laughs> question is basically my question because we were in dialogue but okay, uh, I, I also had that explained I, but I took the store of value point which you've just made but are there other aspects to capture? Mm. Great thank you and I think there was one at the back yeah um, with the glasses waving <laughs> Uh, I mean, a similar theme to the, the two questions you just had. I was uh, wondering when you're talking about digital cash, whether you're talking about digital currency, which almost by definition is controlled by a centralised organisation like a bank, 
for a cryptocurrency, which then becomes a distributed, uncontrolled currency and therefore much more akin to cash. Yeah, good point. I think we'll take another one. Is there one? Is there a question just in front there? No? Okay. So, uh, the back with the beard. <laughs> Yeah, but one thing that uh, really concerns me is about individual civil liberty, and I see moving towards a cashless society, when you look further on down the road, you can imagine them introducing more and more biohacking. So we lose all anonymity on when we make payments. So if I'm just going to a coffee shop having a coffee, if I can't use cash, then that means I'm being monitored. There's a record of everything there. I have no choice to be anonymous. And that's one thing that does concern me. Great. So biohacking's happening already. People are even volunteering to be biohacked. <laughs> are you happy to kick off answering those points around digital cash anonymity? Um, can I never say that word? It's <laughs> anonymity of digital cash and civil liberties and crypto. Yeah. So um, digital cash is a. A way of storing your money and making payments electronically. Now you might think you already have the ability to do that with the money in your bank account. The, the difference with digital cash is, or one of the important differences is like who technically controls and creates that money. So um, the money in your bank account, you might be, well some of you won't be surprised to hear this, but others might, is, is technically the property of your bank. It exists as an IOU from the bank that the bank will deliver on when you want to um, pay for something or withdraw cash. Um, a, central bank, a central bank digital currency or digital cash would be created by the Bank of England. It would be completely risk-free. You wouldn't have to rely on a bank account to use it. Um, it would be like, accessible to use any time. So, um, and I think not having to rely on like big banks is kind of obviously an attractive prospect for a lot of people who <laughs> how they manage their money and make payments. Um, so like the difference between digital cash and cryptocurrencies, um, the, the, the what our proposal for digital cash is um, it's like kind of things like Bitcoin, as I say, in that you don't need to have a bank account to use it. Um, it is <coughs> unlike Bitcoin in that it does have a, a central controlling authority. Um, you you could potentially use some of the technology behind Bitcoin. <coughs> to, you could even like, anonymize the payments if you wanted to. Um, there might there are certain advantages to the central bank being able to like. Um, have an overview of what, what, what everybody's transactions are to like deal with criminality and tax evasion. Um, so I think the, like the the fact that lots of people are interested in things like Bitcoin shows that there is an appetite for people to w want to like pay for stuff electronically, manage their money electronically without having to rely on a bank. Uh, that is a legitimate like desire that people have, and it should be kind of recognised. By the government and like um, delivered through through digital cash. Yeah, the typical politician. I'll mash things together, give you the answer I want to give you, as opposed to the one you you asked. But um, uh, you know, I think the uh, the future of cryptocurrencies is a future of money. Um, you know, I, I'm quite excited by the possibilities of the blockchain, and I think it is you know something that's really really interesting should people decide that that's what they want to do, but it is a, a choice. I think where you've really hit the, uh, the, the issue at the moment um, uh, is about this, uh, this invasion of, of into your own uh, uh, activities uh, through profiling. Um, and we've seen that even one of the biggest tech companies in the world, Facebook, um, this week has actually been, uh, been harvested by, illegally harvested by Cambridge Analytica. And, uh, and, and at the moment, I don't believe there is a kind of protection available to make sure that doesn't happen across the piece. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to make sure that a digital future is a really secure future. And I don't think we're there yet, although I do believe there are exciting opportunities should people decide to part actively buy in and participate. One final word on that, all data, I believe, should be in the ownership of the people who generate it, i.e. you. And you should have the right of ownership over your own data. Great. Right. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if you could 
Yeah, if you want to, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to. Um, there is a, a great deal of understandable concern with regards to data breaches, and I think that that often, very often, um, is the reason for why people want to continue to be um, solely cash or cash reliant. Um, so, I, you know, I don't think you have to be, uh, you know, to wear a tinfoil hat or be a conspiracy theorist to be at least concerned about the notion of um, big organisations losing data or, or, or being in breach of their, their data privacy commitments. And that, I think that, that has a, a, a huge impact on, on people's attitudes towards those big, uh, those big financial firms as well. Um, I might leave Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies to others. Tom B. Hall, I don't think, as far as I know, doesn't have a uh, policy regarding cryptocurrencies. <laughs> 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 um, and I'll just take the chair's liberty of just building a little bit on the, the questions I'm here around um, positive monies proposed on digital cash. And one of the, the exciting things, we don't really go into the report, but we've been doing other work on is how if you did um, have a kind of central bank issued digital currency, then you could, in theory, then uh, rem you could kind of separate out the payment system from the rest of the banking system and remove things like deposit insurance and subsidies to banks and kind of end too big to fail by having this risk-free money that's, that's stored at the Bank of England. Um, won't go too much into that now. So can we take another round of questions? Um, so it yeah, it would be great to see any women put their hands up. I know we're a male-dominated audience, but just kind of encourage, encouraging. So we'll take um, two on this side. Here and here. Sorry, you've just wet, wet my appetite with the idea of separating out one function of money um, from separating it completely from credit. That sounds like a fantastic idea. What else have we been discussing? <laughs> I'm uh, Colin Bates. I'm uh, a supporter of positive money since the day I heard um, Ben Dyson uh, speaking, um, giving his inaugural speech. There are two specific um, points which have kept me supporting the organisation. One is that um, uh, redesign of the balance sheet for the Bank of England. Uh, it was proposed in one of the appendices of your book, Modernising Money. Um, <coughs> the other was that, uh, and that's gone now because I'm thinking too much. Um, so we'll leave that, that would be uh, good. Um, however, what I would like to say is this. Um, <coughs> but I have absolutely no doubt that any attempt to remove money, which, again, your books publish as only 3%, uh, of what is called money. For me, anything other than what is called money, which is real money you can hold in your hands, stuff down your sofas or under your bed, if that is taken away, that will be the end of any control any of us have, which already is almost nil. Uh, so I'm in support of the idea of your campaign to keep money in <coughs> that report. However, anyone who hasn't read this book, which uh, I've only just seen now, uh, it is by Stephen Mitford uh, Goodson, and it is called A History of Central Banking. If you haven't any, if anyone in this room hasn't read it, uh, really this debate is going to be diminished. What I, what I really want to finish by saying is, you, you've put a very good case, in my view, for, for keeping money, and I support that. However, it is being used as we are sitting here in our centrally heated surroundings to increase the homelessness of the country by the victims of the filthy criminal Tory government under the filthy editor of the Evening Standard now. Uh, who, I think ha who has, hang on, you must hear this. Who has, <laughs> laugh, laugh, please do, I want laughter, but laugh for reason. This system of centralised dictatorship from Westminster, now supported and guarded by an armed police force, is not uh, totally, it's totally unsatisfactory and is not a democracy. 
We Thanks for the appointment, Colin. Well, we must, act. what we must have, and I ask the panel to comment how we can do this, is to protect the people who are being plunged into debt by the servants of these criminals at the highest level. Great. And uh, are being thrown onto the streets. Great. Thank and you very much. Afterwards, I can talk to anyone. Yeah, that's I'm great. Gone off and I'm Thank refusing you. to pay anything they're asking of me or demanding of me. They're plunging me into debt. They will not succeed. And we need your campaign to join our support and stop this outrageous criminality Thank you. emanating from your system of centralised dictatorship. Great. The crypto currencies and that are very important to people and to be able to pay and so forth like that. But there's another aspect, and that is our services and those that people need are provided by our financial services sector. And I think that, do you too appreciate the importance it is, for example, to support cryptocurrencies such that we continue London as a financial centre in the finance area, in the crypto area? Because that is where our services and that come that we depend on. There's two aspects of cryptocurrency. One using it, and the other is getting revenue from its use around the world. And at one time, the pound sterling was the currency around the world before the dollar. Now, if we came up with something like Bitcoin, and if we do that right and correct, the benefit to people in this arena, everywhere, in this country, from getting that right and being making money from it, our services are better, we are better, regardless of whether we use it or not. That is a very important point. And we should get that right and be the world leader in it still, as we are now in financial services. Okay, interesting question to finish on. Um, so I'll just take comments from the panel. Uh, let's, let's, yeah, I think let's just go for it. Yeah, um, okay. Um, where to start? Wow, the passion. <laughs> Amazing. Um, in terms of what we're, what we're doing um, to avoid the debt society, you, you know, we, we could otherwise call it, is we, um, my organisation provides uh, debt advice and we negotiate on behalf of people who choose to have our services and choose to have us as negotiating on their behalf with their creditors to ensure um, they're not... Um, penalised or paying over the odds for um, the money that they borrow or, or the services that they acquire from um, mainstream financial services and, and alternative financial services as well. So hopefully we're doing a good job in that. Um, lots of people think so, you don't know, believe me, but we are doing a good job anyway. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's an answer to that one. Um, I wanted to pick up Colin's point on debt, and I don't know how many of you know that um, Michael Sheen is doing a big push on this, and I thought, you know, to pick up, you know, your anger, I'm very pleased that people from every sector now are saying the same thing, really, because he's, you know, a very wealthy actor who's done made good, um, and he's basically from a low-income part of Wales, and he's decided to get together to develop a sort of an anti-debt coalition. Um, and he points out that 3 million UK households are paying more than 25% of their income to creditors, representing 10 million people, or more than 15% of the population. So I think Colin's point is that this isn't just a small number of people that I might see in my surgery or that Toynbee Hall might help you know, every Thursday in a drafty hall. We're now getting towards a sizable proportion of the population. And there's a few <coughs> things which the government could do quickly to make an incremental difference which over you know a decade would make a big difference and they are really basic things which Drew and I wrote together on things like stopping the benefit freeze things like not introducing that the third child in a household doesn't basically get a benefit because only you're only allowed to have benefit for two children not your third or fourth children if you've got a big family which actually is also quite discriminatory in terms of 
different parts of the country and ethnic groups and so on. Um, and also just having sort of proper consumer protection when people are taking out those car loans, when people are trying to get their head around financial um, inclusion issues, because we know from the work of Positive Money and other groups that actually the average age sort of for a lot of people is about 11 in terms of reading age and understanding you know, basic numeracy. And therefore, we have a real duty as MPs, as civil society, to really highlight these issues and to campaign for the government changes, like on those benefit changes, and with the, your campaigning effort, and with us hopefully winning a few votes in the House of Commons, and we've got the numbers on certain of these sorts of issues, we can hopefully change to have the positive vision which the likes of the machine <coughs> have proposed today. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and a couple of things. First of all, just to pick up on your point, because I think we've missed out on the, the response here. It, largely, not completely, it doesn't work 100% of the time, but actually we already have that separation of uh, you know money and credit <coughs> and cash. Um, so you can actually separate cash from credit. Um, by, by well, existing. keep it. it. Well, exactly. And there's yeah. so little of it. Yeah. And the That's why it's important. in the wrong direction. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely, and I'm going to come on to that uh, as well. Uh, <coughs> you, I, I think it is good to hear passion, and you probably picked up from my opening remarks about the fact that I genuinely believe that choices should be made by people and not uh, by banks or by technology. What I fancy or what you fancy coming up in the future is not the thing that we should impose on others, and they, you know, other people shouldn't do that too. Catherine's covered really well. I won't go into detail, but as one of the first uh, constituencies to have universal credit rolled out in 2013, I've spent five years dealing with increasing levels of poverty uh, as people are driven to use food banks, um, working people are driven to use food banks through the system that we've inherited. So I'm certainly not um, somebody who's you know, uh, not going to face down those same kinds of challenges. Now, I'll point out, I'm one of only 39 MPs who's in the Westminster uh, system who's actually actively trying to do myself out of a job. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. But, um, uh, but uh, I think, uh, and finally, I think um, the point you made is absolutely correct. You know, the, and as I alluded to earlier, I, I think there's some really exciting opportunities with cryptocurrencies, with the blockchain, uh, and so forth. And we should be at the forefront uh, of taking forward these technologies. The, the two things are not mutually exclusive. As I mentioned earlier, these are just different mediums. And it's a matter of choice about where people actually choose to do. So why wouldn't you spearhead uh, something like that? And actually, it's incumbent upon governments to actually say, we are going to make a, a positive choice to try to make sure that we are leading. And, but that kind of vision too often is, is either not there um, or it's quashed by vested interest um, and, or, or, or indeed laziness, um, uh, which is uh, unfortunately a part of politics uh, there. But, but all these points are good. I can only give you my personal uh, contribution to saying that I believe these are battles worth fighting that we've raised. Um, I think it's important to remember what people want from money is actually quite simple. They just want a way to, to save, to st a store of value and a, a means to make payments. And I think, like, we shouldn't we shouldn't be trying to compete with like Bitcoin. But we just want a, a simple way for people to manage their money. Um, and and at, the, at the moment, if you want to make payments electronically, you have to rely on almost everybody has to rely on a handful of big banks and they're doing a bad job of serving people's needs. They're doing a bad job of supporting the wider economy. Um, and so I think digital cash, while protecting cash, digital cash is a way of opening up you know, lots more innovation that actually like, meets people's payments preferences. We have a, a public payments provider that with a specific duty to um, provide payment services for people who are currently excluded. Um, and I think we've got to be, like, the, the cashless society is a long way off. It, in fact, it may never happen. But we've got to start planning now um, to, like, to ensure that people's needs, everybody's needs are met um, for the payments landscape in 30 years' time. Thank you very much. And just to say that, you know, positive money will be... Um, 
taking this paper forward to hopefully engage with the uh, recently announced consultation that the Treasury is have, have, having on cash and digital payments and the Treasury Select Committee on Cryptocurrencies and obviously we come from a place of um, making sure that the, the changes that happen are rooted in making the system more fair, more democratic and more sustainable because currently, you know, as we've heard tonight, it really is not. Um, and I think you know, we're all agreed on the panel that that's the direction we need to go in and, and unfortunately that isn't the, the voice that's heard most of the time when it comes to the hype around ex the exciting future of money and payments. Um, but I just want to thank all of you for coming. I feel like it's been a really yeah. great evening. Uh, hopefully you can join us for a drink uh, next door now. Mm -hmm. And also thank very much our panelists because I feel like this isn't a conversation, this side of the story isn't heard enough. Uh, and hopefully uh, you will all tell your friends about this paper and share, <coughs> share it and um, we can ensure the protection of cash over the coming years. So thank you all for coming and thanks our panelists. Thank you.